two men, one goal, the South Pole. In the end, there is a winner and a loser, whereby the latter will not only lose the race, but also his life. The two men who take on the race could hardly be more different. One is a courageous adventurer, the other a rationally calculating explorer. Robert Falcon Scott on the one hand and Roald Amundsen on the other. Both explorers have the same goal in 1911, but only one can be the first. But why did the two men volunteer for this insane undertaking? The simple answer, to go down in history as the first man to reach the South Pole. The heroic age of exploration ended in the Antarctic at the beginning of the 20th century, as many once white spots on Earth gradually took on color over the centuries. From the 15th century and the navigators of Portugal and Spain to Captain Cook's and Humboldt's expedition, the fascination for the uncharted never ceased. The whole planet was to be discovered and mapped, and for every such spot there was to be a first to treat upon it and declare discovered for the history books. This mania was lived out by men like Columbus, promoted by merchants and kings, carried out in the name of science or the church, and almost always driven by the craving for prestige of nations or religions. In 1911, America had already long been discovered, the Sahara crossed and the world circumnavigated. But this rather theoretical point of the South Pole was pretty blank and therefore now targeted. No wonder that the mania for discovery slowly came to an end here, in Antarctica. The sixth, until then rather ignored continent is larger than Europe, inevitable, useless and covered with a layer of ice up to four kilometers thick. Only lunatics dare to go there. When in 98, two Americans each claimed to be the first to have reached the North Pole, the fighting spirit of both Captain Robert Falcon Scott and Roald Amundsen was unleashed. Both have already led several expeditions, one for the British Crown, the other for Norway but both driven by vanity and their own egos. After Amundsen achieved the maritime feat of opening the Northwest Passage from 93 to 96 by surviving three winterings in the ice, he felt that the North Pole was now actually his. Captain Scott, on the other hand, could not accept that an American and not a Briton had conquered the North Pole. Both were now looking for a way to catch up. There is the other pole after all, similarly difficult to reach as the North Pole, but still untouched. Scott set sail on June 1, 1910 on his Terra Nova, cheered on by thousands of his fellow countrymen. He had no idea of Amundsen's plan to do the same. Amundsen had already decided to do this in 99 after hearing about Scott's plans, but he did not reveal anything about it to the public. Instead, he announced that he would sail the Northwest Passage again, but in the opposite direction. He even told his crew nothing. Only when the Fram had weighted anchor did Amundsen reveal to his men the actual destination of the voyage, the South Pole. He was worried that the government that owned the ship would not approve of the plan. He told his crew that it only was a small diversion and that now was the time to beat the English. He gave everyone on board the opportunity to turn back, but no one took the offer. They all wanted to be part of the adventure. On the 12th October, Scott received the news that Amundsen's plan had turned the expedition into a race. The battle was on. Scott set up a space camp on Ross Island on the 4th January 1911. Amundsen on the 14th February at Whale Bay, about 740 kilometers apart, but almost neighbors by Antarctic standards. Amundsen, however, was already 110 kilometers closer to the pole. The two men were so different. This was also reflected in their choice of equipment. The gentleman Scott was sure that the way to the South Pole could not be mastered by men and dogs, so he brought snow crawlers and ponies. He decided against dogs because dogs robbed the train with sledges of much of its glory. Yeah, right, main concern there is to look fabulous. And this decision was to prove fatal. When Scott's first snow crawler was unloaded at the winter's quarters, it broke through the ice. This would not have happened with a dog. The other two broke down soon after. Scott's ponies could carry more than dogs, but they sank deeper into the ice and sweat froze on their fur. They soon became snow blind and apathetic. Scott decided to shoot the last of the horses after their suffering. 
Scott did take a few Siberian sled dogs with him in case of emergency. However, he sent the specially hired Russian handlers home with the dogs shortly after the ponies were slaughtered, as he did not want them in the top team. Now, all that was left for him and the man was to use their own legs. Objectively, Scott had already lost here. Amundsen had already started 11 days before him. His route was 110 kilometers shorter and he relied on sled dogs. Amundsen's team had already learned a normal way how to handle the dogs, how to harness them, how to secure the biting order and how to motivate them. And unlike Scott, there was no ski expert in Amundsen's team. There was simply no need for one as they all knew how to ski. Amundsen took the Inuit as a model. They perfected life under these harsh conditions. That's why he also took fur with him as clothing. Why didn't Scott abort? Was he so deluded, so obsessed with England's victory? Whatever it was, his men now had to pull three sledges. Each each loaded with 360 kilograms. He forced them to walk up to 20 kilometers a day through the windy desolation, which could be up to minus 60 degrees Celsius. Amundsen, on the other hand, regularly called his men to rest and allowed them to stay 16 hours in their sleeping bags every day. Amundsen knew that the winter fur of young reindeer was needed for this, as it did not hair and bought the equipment in Lapland. Scott had bought ordinary reindeer fur, so the sleeping bags soon lost their fur and the men had to freeze at night as well. But even though Amundsen's preparations were much better, both teams were united by the agony of the months-long march through the eternal white. Far and wide, a white desert, without shade, without animal, tormented by the reflected sunlight. Unlike Scott, Amundsen, an expert and strategist with a cool temper, planned his sacrifices in advance. He had half of the sled dog shot on the way. The meat went to the remaining dogs and the crew were also ordered to eat the dog meat, as it prevented scurvy. This was Amundsen's ruthless calculation. The dogs need food and that takes up space and wastes weight, so they took so many dogs with them that halfway through the journey they could throw some of them to the others. Amundsen was a well-prepared psychopath. On the 15th December 1911, the Norwegians shook hands. They had made it to the pole and there was not one English flag inside. They planted the Norwegian flag in the ice and celebrated their victory with chocolate. Since there was no starry sky and the sun was circling the horizon at the same low altitude, Amundsen was skeptical whether they were really exactly at the South Pole. He sent his men out and moved camp several times, leaving the Norwegian flag everywhere to be as sure as possible. He also left a message for Scott. When the five Norwegians started the return journey with the last 16 sledge dogs, Scott was still on the way, with 12 men and 30 days away from the pole. Soon he sent several of his men back to the coast. In the end, there were only five of them left who would make the rest of the death march. On the 16th January, Scott's crew spotted something at the horizon. As they approached, their fears became reality. They were too late. There was Amundsen's flag. It is hard to imagine the emotional scale of the defeat. The agony and the vague hope of making it had been shattered. And now they had to make their way back without horses or dogs and above all without any motivation. Scott finds Amundsen's letter. He wrote to Scott that he should make use of the equipment lying around for his return journey and he wishes them a healthy return home. Scott now also plans the Union Jack in the South Pole and the five Englishmen take a group photo. It should have been their last one. They have made it in second place, but with incomparable stamina. Now they have to make the 1500 kilometer journey home. With a thousand kilometers still to go for Scott's team, Amundsen reaches camp on the 26th January with his four men and 12 dogs. But Amundsen cannot relax. He waits impatiently for the next opportunity to tell the world that he has won. The fear is indeed not unreasonable. Scott's diary later contains an entry erased by image makers on which he writes that he must now be the first to break the news, despite his defeat. But such a lie was no longer necessary. Scott's team still managed to cover about a thousand kilometers on their death march. On the way their fingers, toes, ears and noses froze off. And one by one, team members died from freezing, starvation, exhaustion and suicide. News of Amundsen's triumph has long since spread around the world and Great Britain as a proud conquering nation has been really bad offended. 
But everyone wonders, where is Scott? Soon there were only three of them left in Scott's team. There was now no more oil for the warmth and Scott was writing farewell letters instead of diary entries. His last note was dated the 29th March 1912 and it was only a few months later that the search party set out and found the three frozen bodies in their sleeping bags. In one of his farewell letters he writes, We will die like gentlemen. It was probably a desperate attempt to create his own legend. Thus ended the race, with Amundsen's undoubted victory. Thanks to perfect preparation, it took him and his team only 99 days to cover the 3000 kilometers from base camp to the pole and back. Scott was on the way for 145 days before his death. But Amundsen was not content to be the conqueror of the South Pole. Later he conquered the Northeast Passage and flew over the North Pole in an airship. When he set off in a seaplane in 1928 to rescue the Italian polar explorer Nobile, he himself crashed and has been missing ever since. The race to the South Pole has made both adventurers into legends and is at the same time a monument to human hybris.